Okay, so I'm in the middle of, of doing this, this base painting layer of my corgi. Every once in a while, I can turn off my sketch and see what's still needed. Very important that every other layer that I'm not painting on is locked because that's the, the biggest kind of time-wasting amateurish mistake is to um, accidentally spend a lot of time painting on a layer that's not what you intended. It really just takes you out of the process. The layers are a great asset that we'll be using in finishing off our digital paintings. But right now, we just want to do everything all in one place. Now, every once in a while, especially as you start to finish up your base painting, you want to look at your navigator and kind of see what it looks like from a distance. For traditional painters to do this, what they often do is have a mirror, a little handheld mirror with them um, on their easel so they can look at their painting through the mirror to kind of turn it around and also to see it from a distance. And especially when you're doing uh, portraits, sometimes you need to reverse it every once in a while. So if you need to, you can go to image and you can go to image rotation and actually flip your whole canvas horizontal just to check for a second that things look right even in a mirror image. And especially for portraits, that can be really helpful. You might even like it better this way, right? But do realize if you flip the negative like that, then if you're doing someone like, uh, let's see, like Stephen Colbert, the part of his hair will be on the, diff uh, the opposite side to what it is on TV if you flip the negative. And you'll catch that mistake in a lot of commercial photos just because it looks better from one angle. It is rumored that Jimmy Carter uh, parted his hair on the left side when he started his presidency and realized that his poll numbers were going down, his popularity was going down, and one image consultant said he should part his hair on the other side because it would look better in photos, and he did, and he got a lot more positive coverage after <laughs> that. But then he lost his bid for re-election, so who knows? <laughs> so with, um, with human portraits, not so much with this corgi or animals, but yeah, vanity comes into it and kind of what looks best and wanting to idealize them is definitely part of it. But don't let that, don't let that make you all uh, tight and seize up at the beginning here. I want to see if I can get this bold red in there somewhere. So all these little dogs have the leash that goes around their chest now, which is more comfortable for them, but I just don't find it very aesthetically pleasing. So I have to try to ignore the leash. Ooh, that would be nice. Yeah, that's that's good. Uh, just a hint of a red collar. I wanted to put that strong red in there somewhere. I can often get away with red near the eyes too because of all the blood vessels and stuff. So often I'll just throw in kind of a random color and have to adapt to it. It's not the worst thing in the world. Okay, so when are you finished with your opaque painting layer? So it's when you can turn off you're gray and the whole thing's filled in and doesn't change, right? So there's a lot, but there's not huge areas where I haven't made strong decisions. And so my trick for filling up the rest of it, just like I did with Nina Simone, so I can move on to the next steps, is to go to my painting layer, it's all in one, and turn off my sketch now. Oh, maybe there's a little bit more I can add on the painting layer.
Catholic color. Damn. You're loose. I'm about to add Delta Color. Look at this bowl. I'm about to add black color. All right, so what I'm going to do now is turn off my sketch layer. I'm not deleting it, I'm just turning it off. Then I'm going to use, use my um, magic wand with contiguous turned on, select the empty space around this painting. So I just get kind of a silhouette of my big paint blotch. Go to my gray canvas, unlock it so I can make a duplicate duplicate that shape. Whoops, I have to invert it. <laughs> Select inverse. It's like doing the cookie cutter of the cloud like we did way back when in assignment four. And then hit command J. So what do I get? I get a silhouette of my paint strokes in gray. It's like toning the canvas. And now I have a nice base paint layer for my corgi. I'm going to go ahead and lock them and turn off the gray layer for now. You can lock it and then turn it off. Then I'm gonna go ahead and lock my base paint layer and save it. So file save this as Carl, assignment nine, Corgi digital painting. Now, this is actually a great way to do kind of rehearsal paintings, sketch paintings. And I might do a much bigger painting of this dog for my friend. And I might do it with crayon or with watercolor or with markers or with oil paint. But this introduces me to the colors, the energy, some of the things that I like about it, the things that are gonna be challenging. It's all here already. So now I'm going to close this one. I'm going to open back up my Nina Simone, which I stopped at the same step. And now we'll go on to the next step, right? Which is building soft edges and duotones and basically blending together those different flat base paint layers where they need to be smooth and blended together. So, obviously this is very, this looks very crayon-y, right? Lots of hard edges all overlapping. So now I'm going to lock that layer. I'm gonna lock every layer. I think I wanna build this one up on gray, so I'm gonna keep the gray visible. And then on top of the flat color layer, I am going to, to duplicate it. This is one thing we can try. And I am going to soften it. Filter, Gaussian Blur. And it turns it immediately into kind of a soft watercolor. Especially if I had a white background on. And you decide how much, but I'm gonna soften it quite a bit. From that to that. Now that does a lot to kind of blur it, but now I'm going to use some of my compositing knowledge just to build up some, some complexity. I'm going to go to image adjustments on that blurred copy, and I'm going to go to hue saturation, and I'm going to shift the hue to be a little bit cooler. And maybe shift the saturation up or down depending on what you think it needs. I think mine needs to go down. And I'm gonna make it maybe a little bit darker. So that now there's a different character to the soft edges. See that? Now, this is what I like to do in these kind of quick speed paintings before I build up my duotones. I'm gonna to go to my layer styles and I'm gonna try soft light. You see how that deepens everything? But it keeps everything hard edged. I can also try pin light. And that will kind of soften in between a little bit. You see those gradations that happen? Especially those areas you didn't fill in fully. And then of course, 
I can try things like overlay for more drama. And then I can play with opacity. Or I can just keep it at normal and play with the opacity. So from that, maybe to about there. So it gives me kind of a soft gauze over the whole thing. Okay, now I'm going to lock that. If I guess to help uh, understanding it, I'm going to call this a softened base paint layer. But it's only showing at about 50% opacity. And now on top of that, I'm going to do my my highlights and shadows. And I'm going to call it blended highlights and shadows. So what's the difference? I don't need my speed sketch lines anymore. Now I'm going to use the same brush, but big difference. I'm going to use it at a lower opacity. Not too low, probably about 70%. But watch what happens now when I use it. So I can steal colors from my color reference or from myself. I paint it, I use another color, but look, when they overlap, I get a third color. I can steal that and paint that, I get a fourth color. And I can start blending in and out of them over and over. And I'll get so much more variety because I don't need to worry about filling up the space anymore. Space has been filled up, I get to worry about kind of defining the edges and the shapes I want. Does that make sense? And whenever I introduce a new color, it creates new colors I can steal from. And that is what you want your digital painting surface to be. More layered, more textured, more dynamic than just a range of identical pixels, right? So we're going from this to this, or even more accurately, from this, which is just my flat color layer without the softening, which helps a lot, to this. So let's do it. And if you want, you can kind of mix some interesting colors off to the side, like so. A lot of digital painters like to do that. So I can steal from my own palette off on the side. And then we just erase them layer, later. And so because I'm only at 70% opacity, The more I press on top of it, the more opaque it will get. Ooh, those green tones. They're new, things I haven't seen before. Right, so you can even kind of build a, a nice dynamic palette for yourself. From white to to what's going to work for black for you. All right, I'm going to try, I'm going to zoom in a little bit, but try not to zoom in too much and still keep my brush pretty refined. And now I'll start blending these colors together. And I'm just thinking of the lighting of my, my primary reference. And as I blend in a direction, I'm going to try to follow the shape of the face. And it will soften as I go. But now I get to be a little bit more sensitive to the different highlights. And it's kind of like sculpting. You're defining your shapes and outlines as you go. Remember, white is a choice of paint that we use here. So it's not just the background showing through. We're painting it on top. And if you need the gray behind you to remind you of that, that's fine. Oops. So remember, lock every layer <laughs> that you're not painting on. <laughs> 